Dr. Joe can teach you everything you need to know. You just got to listen. Here he is. Oh, wait, wait, don't leave. Don't leave? So uh, I interviewed Dennis <laughs> on my site four years ago. And uh, why don't you share that story? Because after our interview, I, yeah, I didn't know this. I haven't seen him for four years. Five years. Five years. Five years. So share the story of what happened. Um, well, it was kind of amazing. We, we, Charlie had set up an interview to talk about the mercury treaty and the root canals and fluoride and begin this great thing about how we have Mercury Awareness Week and so forth and the whole project. And after the interview, Joe pulled me aside to go, you know, Dave, you're not looking so good. And I wasn't. I was in a tough spot. And um, I will tell you, that motivational speech started my path to where I am today. And again, I can't thank you enough for uh, showing me the light to my health. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for doing all the good work. Appreciate it. But what was it, 90 pounds? 90 pounds. 90 pounds. That's good. Hey, hand, hand for Dave. So we can switch, right? Okay, good. Thank you. Oh, I wasn't. All right. So, did you have a good lunch? Yes. All right. So, since we are a small group, it would be better to dialogue if you guys could move closer. So, like, no one passed the first five rows, if that's okay with you, unless you got some emotional attachment to where you're sitting. It'd be better, and I think we could learn more. I mean, you could still do every other seat if you want, so you don't want a little elbow room. So is any of this information new to you? Or do you guys know most of it? mTOR. mTOR? mTOR is important. You hadn't heard about mTOR before. Heard it, but didn't understand the importance. All right, why don't we start there? Are there any questions on mTOR? Yeah, because if we're going to have questions, you know, there's no mic, so the closer you get, the easier I can hear, and the, the, the better the dialogue and communication would be. Yeah. No, that, yeah, I, I thought I mentioned that in, uh, in last hour or previously, but it's the concentration of mercury, dioxins, PCBs are all artifact of how long that life form has been living in the sea. So sardines and anchovies typically don't grow within a inch or two, so those are pretty healthy. There's other types of fish that grow that small too, or, or grow that big, or don't grow as large. So those would be good. And uh, I, I know Chris Shade has spoken here before, who in, in my view has the best mercury test in the world. Chris is a great guy, a really smart guy too. And I've dialogued with this about, with, about this with him, and he's told me that he virtually anyone who's he's tested who's been eating sardines or anchovies doesn't have high mercury levels. If they were there, he'd find it with his test. So, any other questions about mTOR? That's a big point, though, because it has the DHA. And <clears throat> the DHA, as I said earlier, is one of the more, most important foods that you can eat. You have a high concentration of And it's important for a number of reasons. DHA is an essential omega-3 fat. But it has a very unique characteristic in the animal kingdom. It's been uh, persistent for about 600 million years in almost all eukaryotic cells, and it forms a very specific metabolic function. Almost every other fat that you eat, you break it down and digest it and burn it as fuel, or store it as fuel sometimes, depending on your, your scenario. DHA is not broken down. It's immediately preserved and transported into cellular membranes because it has a very unique electrochemical characteristics. It's got 22 carbons, and these pi electrons somehow, almost magically, are able to capture the photons from the sun. And these phot the photons have enough energy to disrupt that, the electrons in the pi electron cloud of DHA, and it converts it to a DC electric current. And this DC electric current then energizes your water in your cell, the intracellular water, and it charges this battery 
that, that essentially energizes your whole pathways. And if you're lacking the DHA, you, you could be doing almost everything right, have like a perfect diet, but for whatever reason, don't have enough DHA, you're not going to energize your cellular batteries. Now, let's see, let me go back to that. Peak, this peak fasting is good. Is anyone here doing peak fasting? Oh. Well, why did that do that? Who's doing peak fasting? Okay. That's good. Do you notice any benefits from it? Better sleep. Better sleep? It's good. You know, one of the things that I forgot to mention about nutritional ketosis is that one of the most impressive things about it. Oh darn, this thing is just not doing well. I'm just going to have to go through and use this manually. Yeah, that'll do it. So when you are in nutritional ketosis, you, and these are the things I wanted to focus on. Um, have an, an unbelievable mental clarity. You'll be able to think better. You'll think clearer. And nutritional ketosis is not some wacky, bizarre, recent trend. Okay? It's been actually used therapeutically for over 80 years. And you know what, for what, for what condition? You know, it's been used for, for over 80 years, documented in the literature. Yes. Cancer? No. Cancer is only recent, within the last 10. What do you think it's been used for? You all know it. Seizure disorders. It is the standard of care for intractable drug resistant seizures. It is nutritional ketosis. It's been used for over 80 years. Unfortunately, they, they even do a little more rigid implementation where they have 90% fat as their diet, which is hard to do with like 10 grams of carbohydrates, but it works. And these, these people who have the seizures, primarily children, they have their lives back. Has anyone heard of the Charlie Foundation? Okay, Charlie Abrams was a, is a, or was a Hollywood director, and he, about 20 years ago, his child had this drug resistant seizures, got better with nutritional ketosis, and he started this foundation, the Charlie Foundation, which has a whole variety of uh, resources applied to it, and, and literally decades of experience. So this is not something new. We know this works. Uh, it really is, and if you may have someone that you know with cancer, I mean, it's just B BC. It's beyond crazy not to do this. Now, it's not going to be the only thing. It's not going to cure cancer by itself, but it is a big part of the puzzle because you need stack therapies. You need nutritional ketosis. You need things like hyperbaric oxygen or exercise with oxygen therapy, which they actually have a booth out here, that Live O2, which uh, actually oxygenates your blood more densely than uh, hyperbaric oxygen. I actually have that unit, too. I do it a few times a week. That's a good strategy. Um, so I didn't really have enough time with this, this slide, which is the, uh, the wavelengths. And who, do, who has, still has incandescent bulbs in their house? Well, that's good. That's good. You, so you didn't jump on the bandwagon and try to save energy and convert it to LEDs. You know, the LEDs are really cheap now. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a conversion. LEDs are as cheap as incandescent bulbs used to be, and incandescent bulbs are as expensive as LEDs used to be. You, can, you, you, it's Amazon does not sell incandescent bulbs anymore. I don't know if you know that. They don't. So if you don't have any, um, it's wise to pick some up because it's going to be even more difficult. You can still get them on eBay for under a dollar, but remember, get the ones with the clear coat. If you have uh, incandescence and it's got the white coat on it, that's a phosphor that's going to transmit different frequencies than you see here for the incandescent bulb. It'll have more blue in it because it's, it's whiter, right? So white is blue. When you see white light, the reason why it's white is because it has blue frequencies in it. The amber, orange, 
uh, red is the red frequency, or is the red frequency. That's what incandescent. If you see the wavelengths on there incandescent, that's why it looks reddish orange because there's no blue in it. And that's the safe light to have at night. But I would still use a blue light blocker. I would put these these glasses on any time this after sunset. So in the summer, you know, the, in the at the middle of June. A lot of times you're going to bed when the sun's still up, so you obviously don't need to wear them. So it's not a time of day, it's just based on the biological cycles. And, and conversely, follow that when you get up, so that if the sun hasn't risen yet, you still don't want blue blockers. And the reason why, there's a whole variety of reasons, but it's a really potent influence on your hormones. And one of the most important ones is melatonin. Because blue light will almost instantly, dramatically drop the production of melatonin. And the, and the answer to that is not take a melatonin supplement. That is not a wise strategy. And melatonin is a very potent anti-cancer hormone. Yeah? Did everyone hear that or should I repeat the question? Okay, the question is, could I comment on color-corrected color corrected fluorescent lights, otherwise known as full spectrum? John Ott do, did uh, the world a tremendous service and all the amazing research he did in Disney. And I actually am in the process of, he's one of the books I want to read, but he did a really great service. Unfortunately, one of the bad things he did was popularize this concept of full spectrum. And full spectrum is a, sort of a bastardized term, and it confused me for the longest time until just recently, but it it, it, it it's not true. These, this is the spectrum analysis, and they are not full spectrum. And you get a full, full spectrum bulb. Because I used to buy those. We, we had them, and, you know, full spectrum LEDs. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It's still loaded. Look at the LED frequencies. Now, if it's white, you're going to see. Let me just get the green laser here. You're going to see this peak here. Notice this. This is a this is a dramatic. I just want you to embed this into your brains because once you have this, you'll never forget it. And it's this isolated frequency here that you have in the in the white LEDs that is destroying your health. It was destroying my health. It was ruining your mitochondrial function. It creates excessive reactive oxygen species. That's what blue light does. It has a biological benefit if you do it in the morning and it's balanced with all the other frequencies. Because when you have sun, the sunrise comes up. It's not like this. This is more of like a sun, uh, the because obviously. It's different color outside different times of day, right? It's dark at night, and the more, and sunset is orange, and so, so sunrise. So, in the, in the, I actually should get a slide that shows that. But in the morning, you just have, and at, at sun, sunset, where is this thing? Okay. You have more of these frequencies. So your body is exposed to this. Isn't it interesting? Oh, it goes off. It doesn't stay on. That's the, that's the reason. So I thought it was staying on. Okay, your body is exposed to this, and this actually hit, helps the repair and regeneration. And then later, the blue light comes in, which stimulates the reactive oxygen species, so your body's ready for it, it's prepared, and that sends the signal to actually set up the production of melatonin at night when you don't have any of the light around. The moment you have light at night. So the question is, the color corrected LED? No, it doesn't, because it still has this. I don't care what they're saying, they're lying to you. Okay? Now notice the warm LEDs are a little bit better. They have a, the, this peak for the blue light is way down. And they have a little more red. Better, but nowhere near this, right? The incandescent. So in the daytime, this is not a healthy light to be in. Now, the one, the one that we don't have here that I wanted to mention, and I've just radically changed this in the last two weeks because I've come to a grown to an appreciation. If you look at CRI, which is color rendering index, the CRI of sunlight is 100. The CRI of these incandescent bulbs is 100 in the middle there on the top. The CRI of sunlight through a window is 82. It's the window is blocking important wavelengths. So ideally, we were designed to be outside. And I know almost everyone in here that's not possible. For me, it is because I, just, I have a desk job and I, my desk job is at home. So I, I simply bought a shelving unit, an inexpensive plant or industrial shelving unit that I can adjust the shelves so that the top shelf is ideal height for my little uh, keyboard. And 
I go outside and I'm outside like eight to 10 hours a day now because I do it two or three hour walk and the rest of the time I do my computer work outside with there's no sunlight through the window. So that's, that's the ideal. Now the other component that I wanted, wait, let me, let me finish your question first. So anyway, it's, it's a fluorescent light and is fluorescent on here? The, the, uh, the, is it, uh, this one? Okay, look at that. It's terrible. It, I mean, it, what's, the, what's the sickest looking wavelength spectrum here, right? Is that all fluorescent? Uh, Pretty much all fluorescents. Color corrected fluorescent. Yeah, it might be a little better with color corrected, but not much. It's terrible. It's, they're, they're just awful. Now, there's an interesting study that you guys need to know about. It was done many years ago, over a decade, maybe even 20 years ago. It was because that, that same guy was talking on the plane. He actually had skin cancer. He's an interesting guy. I normally don't talk to people in Vegas. I'm so busy. Uh, but we had actually stood in the lounge. He, I don't see anyone hardly standing up when you go into the lounge, you know, because I stand up and I don't sit down. I like so like this. And everyone sits down on the bar stools. So he was standing up next to me on the other side. And we stand each other for two or three hours. He's typing, I'm typing. And then we go into the plane and he's sitting right next to me. I said, oh, I'll, I'll talk to him. So he was an interesting guy, and he had skin cancer, and he had these same questions about melanoma. He was, he was a smart guy, but he was clueless about this. Most people don't know. They're confused. They believe the dermatologist. So this study, 10 or, about 20 years ago, showed that examined indoor workers. This is an answer to your question, by the way. You think I'm going off on a tangent. I'm not. Indoor workers had a, a, an incidence of melanoma, the dangerous skin cancer, not basal cell or squamous, but melanoma of significantly higher, double or triple than indoor, wait, the indoor workers had higher than the outdoor workers. Now the conventional thought is that ultraviolet radiation from sunlight, the dermatologists tell us, is going to increase our risk for melanoma, right? The exact opposite occurred. What do you think happened? It was never the UV light from the sun that did it. Now, on opposed that same UV radiation without the balanced spectrum of the sun is a problem. But in the outside, outdoors, it's okay. You go inside with the fluorescent with unbalanced peaks. In prim- it was probably higher peaks than that in the blue. And the blue in those spectrums were hitting the tissue on a regular basis without the, without the balance of the red. And it increased the melanoma risk. Plus, there's the fact that the outdoor workers uh, were exposed to ultraviolet B, most likely, and had higher vitamin D levels. And we know vitamin D decreases pretty much the growth of all cancers by about 50%. So I don't want to diminish the importance of vitamin D. You need it. And, you know, if I was stuck in Chicago, I mean, I would get my butt into a healthy safety bed, tanning bed, probably. Not ours, because we don't sell them. I mean, I literally, the FTC had a restraining order against us for, make, for saying that, they, that, that tanning meds are healthy. They don't like that, because the dermatologist, because you know the past Surgeon General. This all happened after the, one of the Surgeon Generals had, uh, was a dermatologist. Like, he was in and out for a few weeks. And then everything, everything started falling apart, and they just tar- targeted tanning beds, because the dermatologists believe it's unsafe and unhealthy. And it, it's basically criminal because they're going to increase the risk. They're basically taking a valuable resource that people need that live in the northern part of the United States in the winter who cannot get vitamin D naturally any other way than swallowing it, which is not the natural, natural the, the ideal way, as I mentioned earlier. So hopefully I can encourage and motivate some of you and catalyze your thinking in that area to start seeking to get this biological radiation. My, new, my newest, newest passion last year was mitochondrial function, but now it's photobiology because I think it's integrating that has an unbelievable synergy. And most every one of us, I mean, this is the, we're in this dark room, you know, trying to learn. I mean, I know it's impractical to be outside, especially with the weather. I mean, it's just, it just wouldn't work, but I mean, we, we pay a price for that. We pay a high biological price. So when you have some control at your office, I'm telling you, this is huge for each and every one of you who are practicing. You've got to look at the light because you're exposing yourself all day long to it. Get out those darn LEDs. Do, I mean, unless you, if you have to in some places where you're not there, the cool white, you know, the, not the cool white, the warm white LEDs are better, as you can see by those lights. But get them out, get rid of the fluorescence, and, and the light that you, if you can and you've got plenty of light in the daytime, which is when you should be working, not at night, 
Don't turn any of the lights on if you've got enough light. I mean, you, obviously you're going to need it when you're operating. But even under that light, what, what type of light do you guys use for the... Is it LED? Oh, my God. Oh. That is crazy. You know, I was just reading studies when I came out. Because the, the, the ophthalmologist, when they do retinal surgery, do you know what they use? LED lights! They are causing photo damage in the retina when they're doing their surgery. So they have all these studies that showing that if they use infrared lights, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. They don't get the damage. So I know you can't use infrared light and there's, you're not dealing with retinal tissue in the mouth. But that's a good question. What would you use? Well, incandescent surgery. Could you use halogens in there? Do they have halogen lights for operating lamps? No? Try to look into it. I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at it, but that is that is definitely an occupational health exposure for you guys. That those LEDs. Unless, can you see like like these glasses? You, most people have tried these types of glasses, right? You know what it looks like. If you put this color filter over your operating lamp, could you could you still do your surgery? Yeah, I, mean, I would play with it. You know, get a filter. You basically want to block out the wavelengths from 550 and, and above. Uh, filter usually, oh, they do? But it doesn't pre, um, harden the composite material that we put in. Oh, so you may, and the UV hardens it? Yeah. Yeah. So that would make sense. So that if you can operate under that, then I would do it. Because you're looking at that light all day long. I'm sorry? It's kind of hard to just, you know, just see different... I know. It's, it's, it, yeah. But I'll tell you, and the, 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 you know, my occupational exposure is not that. I'm looking at LED monitor all day long. And I'll tell you what I noticed, and I think you might notice the same thing in your operating room, or your, uh, what do you call where you operate? Is that what's going on? Okay. I'm not a dentist, so I don't know the jargon. Um, the, if my monitor, when I, I, I really did not like the way it looked when it was all the way to the left. And if you use F-Lux, this is an important tool I want, I didn't have time to mention it last time, but does anyone have F-Lux that they use? Not many. So write this down. This is an important one to get. It should be on all your computers. Because it has another risk. It's not a huge risk. The biggest risk is the LED lights that are on. Then comes your TVs, which are big. Some, most of us have 60 inches or bigger TVs. And, when you, and the, guess when we watch TV? Most of us watch it. What time? Eight at night. Eight at night. The absolute worst time you could ever think of to be exposed to blue light. So it's okay to watch the LEDs, but wear your glasses. Any time sun goes down, these come on. So then you, you're insulated. Now there's other problems with LEDs that this doesn't show. LEDs pulsate at a frequency. It's a digital light. It's on and off. Blink, 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 blink. And it creates this resonant frequency that may be un biologically unhealthy. Whereas incandescents and halogens, halogens is an incandescent light, by the way. I didn't know that. It's an incandescent, so it has a better spectrum. So I said if you could use an ink, a halogen in your, instead of the LEDs in your lights. It costs you a little more. You're going to pay more for that because you know, it's not as energy efficient. LEDs are, there's no question, they have saved us boatloads of energy. It's a magnificent energy-saving process, but you know, solar energy is scaling up. You know, it's increasing. It's 2% of the total energy production in the U.S. right now, and it's doubling every year. But the projection is in a dozen years, it's going to be 100%. And solar energy is progressively cheaper. So energy is almost getting supplied, so it's going to be free. So there won't be an issue. But, but then by, we'll have 15 years behind us of so all this exposure to LED, which is massively bad. So I forgot where I was going with this. Someone bring me back. Oh, Flux. Thank you. Flux. That's what it was. So with Flux, install it on your devices, and primarily your desktops or your notebooks. And when you install it initially, the settings tab, excuse me, is in the upper right corner. You click that, and it won't let you go all the way. The deep, this is interesting. The way that we measure the color of lighting is in Kelvin. Temperature is in Kelvin. And the color of daylight at noon in summer on a sunny day <laughs> is 6,500 degrees Kelvin. That's the color. Guess what color your TV and monitor is set to? 
6,500. You are staring into bright noon sunshine in the middle of summer all day. <laughs> That's what you're doing when you're looking at a monitor. So you don't want that. Now it's okay to actually, now I, I told you I go outside. Now when I go outside, it's really bright sunlight. So I take the F-Lux off because it's balanced. It's a small monitor. I got all the sunshine around me. So I'm, I'm getting the reds, you know, the, and, it, and it's not, not a problem. But if it's, if it's you know, early morning, late afternoon, then you can move it. And if it's at night, you move it all the way to the left. And you can't move it to the left until you go in and you have to reboot your computer to rechange the setting. Because it, no, it will only let you go to halogen, which is 3,500 degrees, and the warm incandescent is at 2,700 degrees Kelvin. And that's the safe one, as you can see the one in the middle up in the up, upper one. That's that, that has the good, it, it, it's still not as great. The ideal monitor, especially in the sun, is, Everyone's seen a Kindle, right? Right? That's e-ink. That's not an LED, that's e-ink. It does have a backlight in there. There's probably an LED, but you can turn it off. And I read a lot of Kindles. I spend probably over 1,000, 2,000 hours on my Kindle. And I never have the light on. It reflects the sun out. So you get held, the, light, the, the brighter it is, the, the easier it is to read. And I'm trying to track down a computer monitor that has it. Now, obviously, it's not color, but at least if you can see it and read it, which most of us are reading, that, that's probably the ideal monitor. Now, with TVs, almost all of them have LED backlights, so you want to wear the glasses at a minimum and don't, you know, I mean, that's when we watch TV at night. But the, the, be, the better option is an OLED, OLEDs, which are just coming out now. They're still really pricey. It's really an amazing technology. Uh, but it probably it, it's a constant light. It's an organic LED. There's no backlight, so it's, it takes away the frequency issue. It's almost an analog. It's almost on all the time. So that's a healthier TV. And, and they, interestingly, they have these ten thousand dollar OLED TVs, but they don't have any OLED monitors yet, as far as I can tell. But I did actually I did order an OLED monitor for HP for my notebook. I ordered it two weeks ago. I'm going to see how it looks. So, but I think e-ink would be better. Yes, question. Can we buy these blue glasses, blue blockers on? Mercola.com. No, no, they're pretty much a commodity item. You can get it for nine bucks. I mean, we we try to focus on interesting things. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about is another one. Does anyone here have reverse osmosis as a filter? A lot of you. Okay, pretty good filter. It gets rid of the fluoride. Uh, there's so many things I want to mention, but. We'll, we'll talk about the fluoride later. So, when you take out, you know, that's why that's why I'm really passionate about getting fluoride out of the water. It's really difficult to remove from the water. I mean, and even RO doesn't move all, remove all of it. Now, does anyone have an RO? Put up your hands if you have an RO, RO filter again. Okay, keep them up. No, keep them up. Keep them up. High, high, so I can see it. I can't see it when it's like this. It's high. So. Keep them up if you don't. If you have a a, uh, a tankless RO. Okay, so most of you don't have a tankless. So that's the next step. Now RO is a pretty good filter. There are better ones, I think. But RO is good in order to distill it if you know how to restructure the water. The problem with ROs, two problems. One is the tank. You have a tank because normally the RO membrane is sluggish and it takes a while to build up enough pressure to capture the water that you can drink, so you need a holding tank. A holding tank works for a few months until it gets contaminated with algae, and then you gotta clean it. So are you cleaning your tanks every month or two? No, who cleans their tanks every month or two? Like no one, right? You do? Once a year. Yeah, well that's not enough, I can tell you. I guarantee you, once a year is not enough. So the ideal is to get a tankless RO system, and then you get a compressor with it. They have them with the compressor. The compressor increases the water pressure outside the pressure of your house, so you can actually fill it. It'll speed up process through the membrane, so you can actually fill a glass in real time and not have to have a tank. Or you, if it's still too slow for you, you can fill up like what I do is a half a gallon pitcher and then put it in the fridge and it's cold. So that's one thing with RO, but the other thing that RO does <clears throat> strips out the minerals. 
and it also relatively destructures the water. So water is a very important component. I mean, it's massive. You've got to get the water right. The ideal water is from spring water. You can go to findaspring.com, which will identify springs that are around your area that you can go and lug the water back. Obviously very inconvenient, but it is the healthiest water. Uh, and a lot of these springs, they don't even charge you. You just go and fill it up. It's just there. You want to have it tested to make sure it's tested it's okay, but that would be the healthiest. And then the next would probably be your own well, but then you still have to structure it. So, but, and then with the RO, you've got to put minerals back in. So rather than, this is a direct tangent of, do I sell these glasses on the site? No, because we, we try to focus on, in, on products that are relatively unique, that are hard to find, that really serve people's purpose of staying healthy. And one of them is ionic ocean minerals. Has anyone read about that on my site? Ionic ocean minerals? Okay, a few of you. It really is. Does anyone garden? Put your hand if you garden. You guys are busy working. You're not gardening. All right, if you garden or you like to grow plants, you've got to get these ionic ocean minerals. It's extracted from the ocean with a vortex. So what is it, what's the heck does that mean? It means it separates out efficiently the sodium and the chloride because the excess sodium and chloride will kill your plants. They don't need extra sodium. That's like if you want to kill a plant, throw salt on it, right? So, but yet it retains all these incredible, like 80 different minerals in the right concentrations that your, your plants, there's usually a bottleneck in some enzyme pathway that they can't catalyze the reaction and it stunts their growth. And you spray these on foliar, with a foliar spray and it's just, it's just incredible, unbelievable growth. Well, wouldn't it make sense if you did the same thing for humans? Well, yes. You can do it. You need a little more refined processing to make sure there's no contaminants in there. With plants, it's not a big deal. I mean, we're not talking about arsenic or lead or anything, but, but just stuff that, you know, it's a little more refined for humans. So we're actually going to be, I was just talking, like, uh, that's the little reason why I was late today, is I was talking with the, 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 the he's a, an engineer from Caltech who's de developed this whole process to do it. So we're going to be having those available hopefully later this year. So you should, if you have RO, get those ionic ocean minerals for sure. I take them every day. I've been taking them every day for about three years now. But I also structure my water. And we've been, this is another product we've been working on for like four years now. We've developed, a, has anyone seen the Vitalizer? Just one or two people. It's a vital, it's a little vortexer. It's noisy as heck. It's like five hundred dollars. It's only half a gallon. And it vortexes the water and structures it. It actually structures it. So we thought that was too high. So we wanted to design something that was half the price and twice as good. So we got a, a vortex. We're trying to get a glass, but the, 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 fortunately these manufacturers don't want to work with it. But we designed a, a basically a silent. The vitalizer is really noisy. Uh, and it's got this Nalfon coating over the spinner, so it's quiet, it's got a variable speed, it's got infrared lights, so it's everything to ma maximize uh, structure and water, based on Victor Schallenberger's work, who is a brilliant guy out of Germany, last century. And uh, so he structures the water, and I put the minerals in, and the minerals get integrated into the, the, the chemical structure of the water, and it makes it more bioavailable, and then I refrigerate it. But I'm actually in the process, and I've ordered one, but I don't have it, is flor a fluoride meter to test the fluoride in my, in my current filtration system. And, and you, you know, if you're getting municipal water, you want to know what it is, unless you, your municipality doesn't integrate fluoride into water supply, but most of the ones in the U.S. do. So it'd be wise to test to see how much is left and see what level you're at. So I haven't, I've ordered mine about a month ago, but I still haven't received it, and I think I'm gonna to have to do a charge back on my credit card because this company messed up. But I gotta get a meter to figure that out. Because, you know, so why do you want to remove fluoride out of your water? It's probably the single most important thing you can do. Do you, do you want to, there's one guy who knows. It was a guy who lectured before me this morning. I'm gonna call him and interview him about fluoride. He actually knew it, I was surprised. But he didn't mention it in the talk, so you may not know. You want me to tell you? Sure. Okay. Fluoride is a dielectric blocker. What the heck does that mean? Well, water is a battery. And the higher the dielectric potential, the higher its ability to store charge and current. And when we put fluoride in that, you sabotage the whole process. That's why you want to have water that doesn't have fluoride in it. I mean, I know it has a lot of other side effects that were discussed this morning. So I don't have to review those with you. And it shouldn't be in your water. It is just not good to be there. So that's high, high priority. That's why you may want to look at getting a fluoride meter. 
to see if your whatever filtration system you're using is working. Now I currently use an alkalizer. The alkalizer um, it's not to make the water alkaline pH, it's to basically throw hydrogen ions back into the water, which are very healthy, these hydrogen ions. And there also these plates, there's like a series of nine plates that alternate every time you use it so that the scale doesn't build up and it still works. But these plates actually help separate out the fluoride too. And I'm using that and a carb, whole husk carbon filter and I'm thinking it's sufficient, but it may not be. I gotta, the only way you know is if you test, right? Like you don't know what your vitamin D is in the level until you test it. You gotta test. You don't know what your glucose level is until you test it. So uh, rather than me ramble on, why don't we, I target it so there's more questions, yes. What are the implications of oral vitamin D intake that's uh, hormonal, et cetera, to be Yeah, uh, great question. What are the implications of taking oral vitamin D? The simple one word, two syllable answer to that, and that is unknown. It's pure speculation at this point, but it, there's very good science behind it. It makes perfect sense. Vitamin D is a marker for UVB exposure. That's one of its primary purposes. It's a steroid hormone. Would I take it if I didn't have access to a healthy tanning bed in Chicago where I lived? I mean, I went to kindergarten to postgraduate medical training within the city limits of Chicago. I'm a Chicago native and never got smart enough until my mid-50s to move out of that climate. You know, it was one of the best things I did. Thankfully, it was a woman. You know, I met this wonderful woman in my life eight years ago. And I was, she was so nice, she came up, to, moved up to Chicago with me. Then she couldn't take it. She moved back down. I finally followed her back down there and it was the best thing I ever did. So, it, and, and I didn't realize it at the time because I didn't understand photobiology. I, I knew it was good for vitamin D and I would go to Hawaii all the time, but it was only like for you know, two to six weeks and it's not enough and it's just massively inconvenient to be in, in Hawaii because of the time differences and, and I just don't, I don't like, I don't like Hawaii actually. The beaches aren't as nice as Florida, plus the people there. So, uh, I mean those, the native Hawaiians, they hate like mainlanders, they really do. They got their reasons, but it's just not a good, it's not like, not like living here. Yes? What about dirty electricity and standing on aluminum foil before you go to bed? Uh, I don't know, I've never heard about standing on aluminum foil, to, just to discharge yourself. I don't think that's an issue. See, that, but let me, let me defer the answer to the question until I explain something I was, wanted to talk about, I'll talk about it now, which is that fluoride again. The fluoride is a dielectric blocker. Not only does it block the ability of water to structure, but it blocks the ability of photon emission from the sun to knock off that electron from DHA to generate that DC electric current and transfer it to the water. <clears throat> so the whole circuit gets disrupted. So you want to have the good biological circuitry going and you want to minimize your exposure to non-native EMFs. And to the best of my knowledge, dirty electricity is not that serious a risk factor. You know, and if you're worried about it, you can put the Stetcher filters in. It's controversial. To the best of my knowledge, it's not a definitive thing. And I've never heard about stepping in aluminum foil the discharger. But it does bring up the issue of what about grounding, which is something similar. And I did have a slide on here. Grounding. Oops, wrong way, sorry. So, because this is, this is the next step, and everyone's heard of, anyone not here of grounding? Okay, so uh, it's an obvious concept, right? It's important. Uh, the Earth's surface is a negative surface. Why is it negative? There's thunderstorms. Every, like every few seconds or a second, there's a thunderstorm somewhere in the planet. This, and then it's the magnetic ionosphere that does it, and there's another variable that contributes to it also. No question the ground is negative. That's why lightning bolts come from the sun, they go to ground. The sun is positive. It's, a, it's an emits, emits photons, it's like a cathode ray tube. So if you've got the sun shining on you, 
walking down the beach and you're grounded with your feet in the water on the sand, you are creating a biological circuit. That's the way you're supposed to be grounded. You're supposed to be grounded with the sun shining on you and not wearing much clothes. Otherwise, the circuit doesn't work. So I don't... I've been a big fan of grounding. I sleep, I've been sleeping grounded for almost a decade. But I'm not sure of the benefit of it. I'm kind of questioning it. I think really the benefit of grounding is what we see in this illustration. Pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, that's what it is. You're like a tree. You're grounded to the earth and you're capturing solar energy. And, and the next year, I'm going to really, really be exploring this deeply because one of my new gurus is Alexander Wunsch, who I've interviewed once. He's an MD, PhD from Germany, and he's probably one of the world experts in photobiology. But I listened to his, I listened, and he could look, you can look up his lectures online. He speaks German. So half, W-U-N-S-C-H. And I'm going to interview him again. I'm lined up to interview him in a few weeks. But I have to listen, to, I've listened to most of his lectures now six times. They were like two hour lectures. Because I just learned every, I'm just starting to get it. It's just so much information packed. But I, by listening to it on most times, he said this one thing that just fascinated me. That only 30% of the energy that we get is from food. Only 30% of the electrons come from food. The rest of it's coming from sunlight or whatever light we're exposed to, because some of us aren't exposed to sunlight. So that's why it's so key. We were designed to be, you know, my basic principles for evaluating interventions to get people healthy is to base it on ancestral principles, kind of like the paleo movement in some respects. And that the premise is that our metabolism, our biology, our biochemistry is optimized for our ancient ancestors because genetic mutations take a long time to switch over and optimize. So we, you know, I mean, if we were eating this way and had these living conditions, we'd be healthy in this type of environment. We aren't. I mean, there are creatures that are healthy in the dark. They, they exist, and the species have adapted to it, and they're optimized for it. We aren't. We are designed to be photo solar collectors. And if you don't get sun exposure on your skin, it's not just going to be low vitamin D that's going to disrupt your health. And, and I'm really convinced. You know, interestingly, if you, we use double-blinded, random control, placebo-controlled placebo trials, right, to figure out sci the scientific method, right? But you know one variable they almost never control for? Artificial light. Blue, you know, on it, unopposed blue wavelength ex exposures. I mean, there's some scientists who study specifically, obviously that's what they control for. So we don't even know. You know, and, and like the Mediterranean diet is supposed to be so healthy. Well, what are the Mediterraneans doing? They're outside, grounded in the sun most of the day, outside with not a lot of clothes on. So who, who's factoring that into the equation? I mean, they look at smoking or sugar consumption, but they're not looking at these fundamental environmental exposures. You know, so it's not even in our concept to even consider this as a, as a, as a variable to evaluate. So that gets back to your question about, you know, what was the question that I said was unknown? D level. A D level, yeah. So, you know, all these other variables that go into it. So, actually, then what did you know? The electric, the electric flow concept. So, groundies. So what I do to sleep at night, I've just recently started this. I've had one for 20 years. And uh, a Magnetico sleeping pad, you know, that static magnetic unipolar bed. They're heavy and kind of pricey. They're a few thousand dollars. And they weigh like 300 pounds. To put it on a queen-size mattress, there's like four mats of 75 pounds. But it, sleep, it allows you to sleep in a static unipolar magnetic field that tends to re help accelerate repair and regeneration at night. Yeah. Right in the back. The, the woman, no, I'm sorry. I said the back, but I'm pointing to it. It's hard with these glasses. You are. No, okay, we'll do you, and then we'll do you next, okay? Okay. Yeah, well, the question is, if we have sun exposure, should we wash it off? Or could we, wash, could we have a shower and wash it off? Potentially, is that the problem? So I believe so. John Cannell believes so. He convinced me of that. And, but uh, Michael Hollick, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's an MD-PhD, who actually defended me in the FTC case, um, for which I lost. 
that was a great thing. It's like they get you between a rock and a hard place. Well, we'll find you a million. Actually, they didn't find us. They said, we give us a million dollars and we'll say anyone who wants a refund can get it. They don't have to give you the bed back. They just give them a full refund. So it's a million dollars. Or you can fight it and potentially spend another million in legal fees and then we'll make the penalties worse. It'll be $8 million. So I was like, anyway, it's a tangent. Michael Hollick doesn't believe that. He, and he's like really recognizes the premier vitamin D expert in the world. Really interesting guy. He's out of Boston University. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's wise not to just for the reasons of mechanics. I hardly ever shower. I mean, I do use soap under my armpits. But I however ever use it on my skin. So why wash up? The sebum has a lot of important beneficial fatty acids, which you know preserve your skin microbiome. So why wash it off? You know, I, I, I just don't believe it's healthy. So in addition to the vitamin D, I think, you know, the skin microbiome. And we're wondering how, you know, how does nutritional ketosis work? It might be because of how it influences your gut microbiome. I mean, there's a very a lot of complex interactions. The same thing with the light exposure. You know, there's this incredible symbiosis that occurs between all the living organisms within this. And it's not just bacteria, it's not just fungi, it's not just viruses. It's, it's the... Uh, Oh gosh, there's in a whole other order that has ten, an order of magnitude beyond those. It's uh, subviral particles that are just massively present, but not as present to common as the mitochondria. Interestingly, we are very efficient energy producers. I don't I believe hardly anyone in this. Does anyone ever read Nick Lane, Power, Sex, Suicide? Then you wouldn't know this. That's where, that's where he's the guy who came up with it. We make density-wise gram per gram, 10,000 times more energy than the sun. Because we have the, the, the we've evolved to integrate these uh, bacteria, essentially the mitochondria are, they integrate into eukaryotic cells and you know, they've evolved to perform this function of, of ATP and, mit and signaling and apoptosis and you know, that whole system allows us to generate a lot of energy. So it's pretty interesting. An interesting fact about mitochondria. Okay, so I know I promised you. Yes. Okay, I have two questions. One has to do with fourth phase water and Gerald, Gerald Pollack's research. Mm -hmm. Easy water. Right. The fourth, yeah. fourth phase of water, right? Right. And um, I was wondering whether reverse osmosis is a small enough filtration to create that um, uh, no. filtration. No, no. So, so the first question is Gerald Pollack, who's a biophysicist at the University of Washington. Um, he's developed the concept of easy water. He's a really smart guy, but to the best of my knowledge, it destructures the water. Distil distillation is worse, but you, so you still need to structure it. That is the other problem. And fluoride will prevent water from being structured as No, it doesn't prevent water structuring. What it prevents is the electrical potential from being optimized. Okay. Yeah, because easy water that Pollock describes, or structured water, is actually primarily formed intracellular. That's the water that works. That's the water that's in all of our cells. And you can't maximize that structure until if you've got dielectric blockers hanging around. I also read that we are hybrids and that we can photosynthesize to a small Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I have not yet fully explored that, but there's no question about that we have a lot of similarities to plants uh, with respect to how we... Uh, absorb photo radiation, which is you know what I believe we are designed to, and almost everyone in this room, hardly anyone's doing it. You know, you almost have the only people in our, in our culture that do it are really outside workers. You know, like laborers, like people who cut the grass, or you know, it would be the primary one I would think of. Well, grow lights can be healthy, you know, actually. There are some benefits for it. It depends on, I still don't understand it. This is a new passion of mine. I'm literally like six, seven weeks. So I'm just immersed in it, but I've got so much more to learn. So, uh, yeah, but there's enough that I know now that I could help a lot of people with. I mean, this LED, avoiding this LED light is crazy. But the other, a lot of it's speculation too. We just don't know. I mean, this vitamin D I think is going to be huge. I mean, I think we're going to probably experience some long term unexpected, the law of unintended consequences, you know, of taking oral vitamin D in high doses. 
yes, it's going to help something, but what else is it going to screw up down the road because we didn't get it the right way? We thought we were so smart. We always think we're smarter than Mother Nature, you know? You know, with these hormones. Interestingly, if you can optimize photobiology, I'm pretty convinced from what I've learned already that you'll optimize most hormones. Unless you have some surgical intervention where you do you yank, you know, yank out a woman's ovaries for some whatever reason. You know, that's not going to restore that. But assuming you haven't aborted normal biological function, you should be able to restore it with optimizing photobiology. And it's, it's a missing part of the equation for most every single one of us. We just don't get this. I didn't get it. I didn't get it till literally this summer. I was clueless. Clueless with a capital C bold 72 point font. I didn't understand it, and I, and I was really damaging my health as a result of it. So, but it's it's literally my new pen. I can't wait to. It's, I'm so excited, like a kid. It's like a it's this giant puzzle as you put all the pieces together. Yeah. Have you ever done any dietary calories in? I, I'm sorry. What's the question? Have you ever done the math dietary calories in mm -hmm. compared to the energy loss in traveling in a 60 degree environment? So uh, it's, it's a complex question about essentially calories in, calories out. And if there's better study that, I mean, if I'm, if there's no doubt in my mind, it's a flawed hypothesis. We are not a closed thermodynamic system at all, in any way, shape, or form. So I, I personally, now that I'm a nutrition, I think I need to be about 170. I'd like to be about 180, 185. And I've been eating between 4,500 and 5,000 calories, and I lose weight. Tell me if that makes sense. You know. I just can't gain weight with this stuff. I mean, because you, your body, I don't, I don't understand it completely right, but you're optimizing these pathways that just don't store fat. So if you don't store fat, it's hard to gain weight. And I'm not eating a lot of protein because I've absolutely convinced that. And I could, you know, half the stuff I can tell you would be wrong. It's just my belief. But I'm pretty confident from what I've known in the past. You know, kind of merge these things. It seems, it seems to be. I've got this, I don't, I've got a few talents and gifts. And one of them is to be able to have a pretty clear understanding of what is correct, even though it's counter to what the conventional thought is. And it winds up being 10 or 15 years later, I was right. I can remember when I was in med school as a, re as a resident or an intern. I think I was an in I might even be a medical student. And I read, I was reading Lancet, and I read Barry Marshall's, remember Barry Marshall, right? He's a the MD, family physician, physician from Australia or New Zealand, I think Australia. And he said, oh, it's the, H. pylori, actually it was Campylobacter jejuni back then before they renamed it, that was causing these things. And I would, you know, I would be trying to put the patients on antibiotics, because you know, as, as students where I went to med school, we had a lot of, really, a lot of, really, a lot of stuff. So, but then the attendings would come and then the specialists and they, they'd like berate me and like, it was crazy. And then literally 15 years after that, the guy wins the Nobel Prize for that. So I think, I think we're going to see a similar thing about here because it just resonates with truth to me and what most of the things we're talking about. Okay, back there. I'm sorry? I have one question and one comment. You keep talking about blue line. You talk about wavelengths. Mm -hmm. You then talk about wavelengths, then you should talk about wavelengths the natural light well that the, so the question becomes about wavelength versus wave form and I, I couldn't just, I couldn't agree more but I did I believe I mentioned that but even with the right or the the right wave form, Isolated blue light will cause damage. I mean, the studies are really, really clear. There's just incontrovertible evidence on that. But that's why I said you want incandescent lights, thermal sources like fire, which is a natural wave. It's an analog form of light. That's why digital lights. And I still haven't figured out, you know, if these are, if these are incandescents, I can take my glass, glasses off. But I think they're, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to chance it. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Yeah, ideally you want it, it, it for the lights that you're going to have on at night, the few lights that you need. Yeah, can anyone look at me and make a guess what they think those lights are? LEDs. There are LEDs? Who said LEDs? 
You're convinced. Okay. All right. I, yeah. Better safe than sorry. I actually, in my, my hotel room, in this hotel, there was one bulb that was incandescent. But then I realized I have a checklist before I travel. There's about 100 items on the checklist. I have to add a new item and bring two incandescent bulbs with me. Pack them securely. <clears throat> So yeah, you d so in your home, where at night and in the morning, wherever you need light, make sure it's a clear incandescent bulb. I go to the extreme of wearing the glasses too, probably because there is some blue, right? The way this, but there is blue in the incandescence, not just not much, and it's, and it's sort of sort of overcompensated by the rest. But certainly at night, more important at night to put these on. These should go on by anyone after sunset. You don't want blue. And you want really, really high levels of melatonin. And the way to do that is to no blue light after sundown, sundown and lots of bright light in the daytime. That's the combination to get high melatonin. And when you take it, when your body makes it, you get the perfect concentration because you're in natural feedback loops. You're not going to get too much, you're not going to get too little, just like Goldilocks. There's an excessive one. Melatonin is a great hormone. Okay, uh, this side here. Sure. Comments on PEMF, pulse electromagnetic field therapy. Uh, I have some concerns um, because of the radio frequencies that are emitted. Uh, there's some of the people I follow, the experts who have concerns about it. I'm still in the evaluation stage at this point. I think there's probably some that are healthy, like native PEMFs. Uh, and Magda Haas, as I'm sure many of you know, she's actually signed off as on one of these as being healthy. She's got a lot more depth of knowledge. Am I being pulled now? Okay. All right, I guess that's it then. All right. Thank you.